Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the City of Pleasanton Economic Vitality Committee for Thursday, March 17th. Happy St. Patrick's Day to all on the phone. And um, I only have to pinch uh, one person that I can see. So far, that's pretty good. Um, I did have to run and get my scarf. Um, but hey, to all the good Irish and all of us. So uh, let's start with our call to order um, for today. And Miss Sylvia, would you be so kind to lead us off in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. Can we stand, please? I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Nicely Thank done. You. Thank you. All right, Miss Lisa, would you take us through a roll call, please? Yes. Good morning. So if you're present, please say aye. Andres Ripa. I can see him here. Okay. Brian Wilson. Aye. Ellen Penske. I okay. don't see Harsh. Councilmember Balch. Present. Board Trustee Makashi. Here. I don't see Laura Brooks. No. Okay. Michael Lee. Hello. Rena is coming on. I see her. Rena. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. I will be primarily in a listen only more, just so you know. Okay, I'm kind you. of <laughs> attending double meeting. So thank you. Steve Baker. Hi. Steve McCoy Thompson. I do not see him yet. Steve Van Dorn. Aye. Sylvia Tien. Aye. <laughs> Tiffany Cadret. Aye. Tracy Farhad. Aye. Will Dorlick. Aye. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, do we have any agenda, any amendments to the agenda today? No amendments to the agenda by staff. Okay, um, let's move on to our consent calendar. Um, and of course it starts with our meeting minutes of February. So um, for those who have had the chance to review it, look at it, can I get a motion to approve our minutes of February 17th? So moved. Thank you, Will, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Steve B. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Okay, we're now on to public comment. Uh, Lisa, do we have any public comments? Or is anyone joining us as a guest today? We do not have anybody viewing the meeting. Thank okay. you, Tracy. It was a little too early for them today too, given our uh, time change here. Okay, uh, public hearings and other matters. One of my favorite parts of this meeting, um, we have Council Member Jack Balch giving us the latest update. Jack. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, happy St. Patty's Day. Uh, yes, I will be doing my corned beef and cabbage later today, following my grandmother's recipe. Uh, so since our last DVC meeting, there's been three council uh, meetings, so I'll just go over them briefly. Uh, the first was the special meeting at the end of February for the districts. At that time, the council chose the tangerine plan, uh, which was advanced. On March 1st, the second meeting of uh, since our last, uh, the council uh, basically did a couple of things I think the EVC should be aware of. We extended the um, cap on third party, th third party food delivery services. And I believe the cap is 15%, right, Pam? Is that, okay, yep. Yeah. So that is a six months rolling. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking at re-upping it now and, uh, you know, when that uh, curtails or not is, is still a bit of fluidness. Uh, there was also the mid-year budget. You probably read in the paper, the city has actually had a stronger return of sales tax and some other uh, sources of revenue. So we actually were able to move some of that money, approximately four plus million dollars into CIP uh, 
for our projects that we have to build out. Um, there's some challenges at different points, but the other thing that came back during that presentation was the CalPERS numbers related to um, our pension obligation and, and our unfunded pension obligation. Uh, all prior uh, involvement with the budget that I've had has shown that the city's operating budget would be constrained to meet its current obligations for uh, pension obligations. This is the first time where CalPERS has had a significant healthy return, sufficient for us to probably not have that challenge on our operating budget. And when we don't have that draw on the operating budget, it would allow us to do other things. There's still a period of about five to seven years that uh, is a bit of question, so stay tuned. Uh, the other thing on the agenda was Ray Street. There was an application for an in new parking uh, and a parking lift in downtown. So the lift is at the option of the applicant and uh, an interesting conversation about that and uh, the parking in downtown. The tangerine plan was then also further advanced, uh, receiving its first um, reading, if you will. And then uh, just on Tuesday, the 15th, the council had a meeting that was pretty packed. It was one of our longest, uh, which is maybe not saying too much, but uh, we did a proclamation for the arts and we also did a proclamation for Meals on Wheels. March is, uh, it's March for Meals Month for Meals on Wheels. And uh, just if you haven't um, supported that program or if you have time and wanna deliver meals, that might be something you wanna look into. Um, on consent, the council did advance the downtown, excuse me, the non-downtown grant program for parklets that this, this body looked at. So that's the $250,000 allocated for grants to businesses that wanna do parklets that are outside the downtown program. Um, there was just a bit of comment that we didn't want the plastic siding type of elements. We want more of a durable, but beyond that, it was advanced. And then on the main event, we had the Ken Mercer Sports, uh, Sports Park Skate Park design. Um, the skate park uh, is basically done in conceptual drawings. It needs $50,000 approximately to advance to construction plans. Uh, but the council received, I would call it a sticker shock by several of us. Uh, skate park in Pleasanton is estimated to cost about $8.5 million. So that is uh, definitely a little bit more than we expected. And uh, conversation about all of that uh, was, was aware of the cost. Um, and then we went for uh, what programs to include in the housing element. The housing element's been a, uh, we're about halfway through. We've got still this full year left to get through the housing element update. Uh, the in-lieu housing fee, the fee you would pay if you were not able to put the uh, affordable housing at your site. Uh, it was talked about increasing that based upon prior 2018 studies, Nexus studies, redoing the Nexus studies in future years once possibly the pandemic effects are minimized or diminished or maybe stabilized, and then um, keep the, the, the way the council can spend the money keep that broad so that we can have flexibility in how the money is spent because the council does direct that money to more than just brick and mortar housing for, for those in need. Uh, we, we subsidize a lot of rental agreements for low income stuff and a lot of uh, homeless outreach programs. Uh, the other thing was possibly adjusting the fee to be based on the size of the house that you ultimately build. Uh, because the fee for a 5,000 square foot home is the same as the fee for a 1,500 square foot home. Um, as we moved on, we talked about the inclusionary housing ordinance. Uh, that would be if you are building a larger project, the number of units you need to include. Uh, it stayed at 20%. Uh, so that will be the number I think that will advance further. Right now we have one at 15 and one in 20, and we decided to go with parity on both. Uh, workforce housing was discussed, but affordable by design and missing middle. If you want to see possible solutions to housing challenges, there's a great attachment to our staff report. I think it's attachment five, talks about missing middle housing. Uh, it's really well done. It's really uh, illustrative of what you can do to have uh, multi unit projects that still look like a single family home and therefore they are possibly more compatible 
with the existing neighborhood they would go into. So if you think of Birdland or some of these existing neighborhoods we have in town, the council uh, flirted with that idea a little bit and staff's gonna look into it further. Uh, kind of the other things that rounded out the late night uh, was water drought. So just so that you are aware, there was an extensive lengthy conversation about drought rates and the council ultimately did decide to advance drought rates on your water bill beginning from May 1st. You will start to receive or see those bills in July, I believe, Pam, was what I think. Uh, yep, so July. And so uh, the drought rates is 65 cents across the board, all tiers. Um, and so that was to stabilize our enterprise fund because as people do conserve to comply with the uh, drought request we've done, uh, our reserves are dropping and we have to uh, obviously have a viable fiscally sound uh, program. And then lastly, the Tri-Valley Joint Residential Recycling Fill Station, Recycle Water Fill Station. So I don't know if you remember, but back in the last drought in 12 and 13, uh, we had it where DSRSD at the Johnson Drive at that, that treatment plant, they had it where you'd come and fill your, your cube uh, approximately 280 gallons of water, and, uh, and it was all recycled water, and you could use it to supplement. Well, uh, the Tri-Valley got together and decided to go forward with that in some fashion, but they've decided to locate it out at Gleason Road up by the uh, courthouse there, the new courthouse for Alameda County. Uh, there's some challenges with it, there's no doubt. It's, uh, it's approximately $1 million to build it out. It'd only be available for five years, uh, but in the end, the council did advance it. We adjusted the rate a little differently than what the other Tri-Valley counties, uh, cities did. They all put in about $100 to use it per season, but uh, our council decided uh, to try to make sure it did uh, become neutral to the water fund and did increase it to $150. So there's not parity yet with our Tri-Valley neighbors and we hope staff will be able to work to resolve that out. Um, just a quick other thing, and that completes, by the way, the meetings. Uh, as to the survey on the agenda today, uh, my company was called three times, by the way, I should mention. So we declined to participate in the survey three times. And uh, upcoming for the council, the council's, um, as, as every city does, we have a lot of things we'd like to do amenity-wise for the community. Those are typically called CIP projects. On April 12th, the council's gonna be having a special meeting to try to prioritize them uh, given our caviar dreams on a beer budget. So uh, that will have to resolve out some of this uh, grandiose plans we have into, into where do we actually focus to, to achieve some things. So just if anyone's uh, uh, subscribed to the council agendas, that might be one to watch. And I apologize because I've got an 8.30 meeting, so I'm gonna depart shortly after this. So thank you. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate that. Um, I, I was ready for at least five more minutes. We, we apparently have met too often, in, you know, or there's been less time in between. Or yeah, we only have three council meetings versus five. Yeah, right? only three easier. instead of the five of, of February. That was a, that was a crazy month. Um, uh, anyway, thank you very much. Um, okay, so we are now um, going to our special guest for today and to introduce uh, the guest and the survey and the results of that. Um, Miss Lisa, would you like to um, do the introductions? Yes, thanks, Tracy. So as you all recall, um, EBC members, we met in October to discuss our business needs and recovery survey. And that was is when the committee reviewed the survey instrument and we were introduced to our consultant, um, Kurt Bailo with FM3. And so the survey was conducted earlier this year in January. And so we are going to be reviewing the preliminary results. And so um, I will go ahead and introduce Kurt Bailo from FM3 Research. Oh, good morning, I'm Kurt Bailo. Uh, I was on our call was it maybe two months ago now, maybe three months ago, I can't remember now when we had a preliminary conversation about reviewing the last survey and what types of questions to include or not include. And so I'm happy to go through this presentation. I promise I won't go through it three times with you, just once, so keep, keep it short. Uh, although there's quite a bit of slides in here. Let me share my screen. 
All right, so here we go. So a little bit about the methodology. All right, um, so we connected a little over 300 interviews um, and we got the list from the, uh, from the city, obviously with the business license list. And we were able to, so we did phone calls and email invitations. So we did a mixture of online and phone interviews. Um, and what we were able to pull and the staff was able to aggregate for us at the sample side, and we finished these interviews basically in a month, kind of the last two weeks of January, first week of February, um, was that we had zip code, just two of them. Um, we also had number of employees from the licensing list and also business category. And we, the city actually can consolidate some of those so that we could make sure that the mixture on those at least three variables of respondents reflected the overall database the city had. So we were able to make sure that we were getting a representative sample at least by those different different categories. All right, so who are the folks we end up talking to here? Um, so most are small businesses. So we let people pick multiple questions here. Almost all consider themselves small businesses. Three quarters were headquartered at Pleasanton. Um, this is a new question we haven't asked before. Two and five said they were woman owned. Uh, about a third said they're minority owned. And four percent said they were LGBTQ owned. So this is the first time I think you've had this sort of data at the city level. So it's interesting to kind of look at the mixture of different business um, types. We also asked how long have you been in business been in Pleasanton, uh, a pretty pretty wide mixture. I was kind of thought we would have a more of a tilt of the double digit years, but, but it was actually almost half of them been around in, in, business, in Pleasanton for, for 10 years. So a pretty even mixture. We did ask how many square feet the business had. Um, a quarter, a little more than a quarter said they don't know, but the vast you know, not that vast majority, but a good plurality or less than 2,500 square feet. Um, not too many, any more than 5,500, but still more than one in 10. <clears throat> we also asked how many employees do you have in Pleasanton versus outside of Pleasanton? Um, so about a quarter said, hey, there's just one of me. Um, and that's all I've got. And then a third said there's just a, you know, less than two, two, three, four, or five. Um, in terms of employees outside of Pleasanton, not surprisingly, maybe only half had any, uh, and those who did, either it was a handful of employees or they were unsure how many they had. Uh, and these are the business types. So this is from the sample we were able to, to make. We put them. In, there was actually more categories than these, but to, for the to be practical, we rolled a couple of the smaller ones together. That sorry, the city did actually because we weren't as close to those. Um, about a third were business services, and then kind of one in ten split amongst a variety of other different categories. Um, in terms of and throughout this, this presentation, you'll notice that the italicized subtitles, or sometimes they're in the footer, is the actual question language that we either read to somebody on the phone or they read online. So, do you feel like you'll be in Pleasanton two years from now? Four out of five said yes. That's probably the case. Almost half said definitely yes. So, only six percent were a little more, you know, pessimistic about that. Uh, you know, maybe they're going to cease operations for other reasons, uh, about one in 10, 12% were, were unsure. So quite a few thought, yeah, we'll be around here in two years from now. And then we asked about the, uh, a couple different metrics here. Again, thinking forward, are you gonna be in the city two years from now? And how much revenue do you think you'll have? Number of employees, number of square feet of space, um, more or less. Um, so there's a, a little more thought they'd have more revenue, 40, 41%. Um, we have a, a kind of consistent, and pessimistic might be too strong of a word because there's other business reasons why maybe you feel like you'll have fewer employees or what have you, but there's a solid kind of 15% on that right-hand side. Um, the more sort of expansionistic point of view, the amount of revenue, two and five they'll have more, three and 10 thought they'd have more employees. Um, in terms of office square, you know, business space, most of them, not, that's not going to change in two years. So there seems to be a little bit of a leaning towards more revenue and more employees uh, 
across the different businesses we spoke to. All right, so that's kind of, those are not the real specific policy types of questions here. I want to get into those in a second. Next section is, all right, if you're a business, how do you feel about just doing business in the city of Pleasanton? And, you know, probably the big question here is, would you say that Pleasanton is an excellent, good, fair, and place to do business? 84% said excellent or good. Um, that's a little bit down from 2015. Obviously, uh, all these numbers need to be taken into the context that we were just starting to come out of when we took the survey, a, a two-year pretty intense pandemic that is probably going to be with us in one way, shape, or form for the next year or two. Um, but we started doing the survey in the middle of January. We're just starting to get out of the Omicron mm -hmm. wave. We're still kind of in it in many of the area communities. So I think all these sorts of questions, we did ask about the city's response there too. We'll see some questions about those later. We need to be taken in that context. Um, but still, vast majority of businesses we surveyed said it's a, it's a good place to do business. We broke this out by a couple of different categories here. Um, so whether or not you've been at, how long you've been doing business in the city didn't make a huge difference. Number of size employees, a little bit of a difference there. Those, the, the you know, it should say probably one to two employees. I think there's a category in the database uh, that has zero um, for self-employed companies. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe they're a little less bullish, but still 79% said it's a good place to do business. And then by geography, it didn't really make any difference. So we did ask for each of those categories, so excellent, good, and so forth. If they, if you picked one of those and took the survey, we said, well, thank, you know, you said it was an excellent place to do business. Why? Um, and then we got a bunch of open-ended responses, and those fell into sometimes multiple categories. So these percentages were out to more than 100. If any of you are adding them up furiously at home right now, um, but the types of things were, you know, just generically, hey, it's a business-friendly place. Actually, a quarter were just talked about the location, about something about the space of, of Pleasanton itself, the open space, the location. Um, it's you know, it's clean. <laughs> Uh, crime is low. There's 16% uh, support from city government. Um, those are types of things there. Not a lot of comments about ease of service or downtown or commute. Those sort of things were not seen as reasons to cite the city as an excellent place to do business per se. We asked uh, those of the those who said it was a good place to do business, and not shockingly, it's about the same percentage here. Uh, same types of categories. What I think is a little more interesting is when we kind of lump together, and there weren't that many of them, only 36. So keep that in mind. Who said it was only you know, a, a fair place to do business? Um, and taxes were about a third of those folks side of that. And then housing, and we'll see that as a theme as we go through here a little bit here. So about a quarter of housing. Very few people, only nine respondents of the over 300 said it's a poor place to do business. They've also mentioned taxes. They talked about mandates and housing costs. We didn't put bars next to those because only nine responses here. It's a, a little deceptive. But that seems to be kind of the, the theme here. You know, parking, some public safety concerns, um, also in the mix. When I get to the next section, I'll, I'll pause here. Uh, in terms of Pleasant's location, which we saw pop up amongst those who thought the city is an excellent or a good place to do business, we asked um, them to rate um, the city's sort of lo location by a variety of different metrics. So 80% said it's an excellent good location as a good place to attract customers. Um, and similar numbers said the same about accessing customers. Um, the only real difference is here, if you get down towards the bottom of the list, those last two items kind of caught our eye, attracting qualified employees and retaining them virtually identical percentages. So you've only got about a half of respondents who said that the location was an excellent or good place um, in terms of those metrics. And about a quarter, 23% said fair, and then a little bit fewer than that said poor. And this goes to this, these housing challenges um, that are not specific to Pleasanton, certainly, but to the broader Bay Area. 
in terms of the infrastructure in the city, uh, as far as what perceptions were that, hey, roads look, look pretty good there. 79% said excellent or good. Um, kind of, if you look at the next four, they're all in the same sort of range of 67 to 73 sewer, telecom, electricity, public, and, and water, public transportation services, which is more challenging in the sur suburban communities in the Bay Area. Only 47% said excellent good there, um, but actually a pretty good chunk that they didn't really know. So they may be something where they don't personally use public transportation or the type of business that they run doesn't seem to have like a particularly, um, you know, it isn't really dependent upon that. In terms of different quality of life elements in the city, downtown, hey, people, these businesses like downtown, 81% said, the downtown and Pleasanton is excellent or poor, poor or uh, sorry, is excellent or good. Um, <clears throat> recreational opportunities, variety of restaurants, shopping, public schools, all seven out of ten said excellent or good too. Entertainment options, uh, and then you know that's clearly in, its, in a second category there. And then you get down to the bottom one. This will come as no surprise. I don't think that anyone here is the uh, affordable housing for employees. 47%, so nearly half said poor. Obviously, this is something everyone's wrestling with right now, but clearly stuck out for the businesses that we spoke to in the city. Um, we did add, uh, uh, this is a, one of the newer questions too, which is uh, opportunities for businesses to work with local students. Um, half said that they were at least somewhat interested uh, about the same number were not particularly interested. For questions like these, um, we, if you're, if it's a question that's about whether well, someone would take action here, we, we probably look at that top dark bar, uh, very interested, 24%. That's probably a little more realistic, you know, about a quarter, which is still pretty high, um, said they're interested in, in you know, working with local students. Um, those who were more likely to indicate that were food service, education, and tourism business categories. <clears throat> All right, so we, at, we asked about these particular five different um, service categories, and we, had, we asked two questions. First was how in, important are they for the city to provide, um, and then we asked how satisfied the, the business was. So public safety, top list, this is consistent with the community survey of, of residents, and not surprising there. Um, other ones were still seen as quite important. Roughly nine out of 10 thought they were at least somewhat important. Business recruitment, it, it, on a list like this, it's sort of like, well, it's clearly the least important of these five, but still three quarters said it was at least somewhat important and 44% said very important. So, so no one was dismissing these business or these types of services the city can provide, um, but there's a clear Still some ranking within that list. And then in terms of sort of rating them as the city does, um, it's really nice to see that these rankings are in almost exactly the same, actually are in exactly the same order. So public safety was seen as the most important type of service the city provides. It's also the one with the highest level of rating here, 88% excellent or good. Um, similarly, you got the kind of rankings in those middle three and then business recruitment comparatively was the least important service category. It's also the one where the ratings was one of the lowest. So that's not to say that you want to be, you know, any of these to be low ratings, but you want the lowest ones to be the ones that are deemed the least important, at least relatively speaking, so that they're really comparing themselves up nicely. Um, but about a quarter, we're really unsure about business recruitment efforts that the city does. Um, that might explain some of that. All right, I'm going to pause here. Um, we still got a, a couple of different chunks of stuff here. Maybe I'll pause and see if there's any quick questions about what we're seeing in the first couple of sections of the, of the presentation. I don't see. And if any. not, it might be. I just had one quick question, Kurt. Um, public communication. Um, did were did. Did, were they given uh, what that is or just 
I mean, I think that was a track a question that one was just given that that particular phrase there um, because we've asked that way uh, that way in the past. Okay, thank so. you. I have a quick question. All right, I did promise. Um, yes. Yeah. Just real quick, and you might have already said this, but uh, what was the percentage of responses to the survey compared to the total pool? So uh, were you able to, I know you said the number of respondents in the beginning slides, but was it like 30% or 40% um, response rate is sometimes low in surveys? So I was just curious. Um, maybe, uh, I don't have the tip of my finger uh, Lisa might be able to pull up what the total list size was. We actually culled the list a little bit for content information. I can open up a different window and get an answer to that when I'm done sharing my screen. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Brian? Yeah. yeah, question for you, Kurt. Hey, thanks a lot. This is great information. Um, <clears throat> so of the folks who were not at all or just not interested in sort of doing any internships or working with you know local students do you know what kind of companies those were made up of i know the folks who want to work with kids you know you talked about that in, in tourism and food service but what about the the group of businesses that were not all interested in dealing with students do you know what kind of categories of business they were in yes i could pull that up too again I'll, i'm done sharing my screen i should look at some of the cross tabs on that okay all right, I'm just writing down a note here. Yeah, Brian and everyone, this is Pam. This is exactly what we were hoping to get out of today's conversation, which was where you want some additional exploration. So if we don't get to all the answers today, we're noting them all, right? Yep. We can go back and do the work on that. Because I don't want to make sure sit here and try and research yeah, that's fine. questions. So great. Um, Steve. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Lots of good information. I have a comment and a question. The comment is that uh, PPIE is actively working with a school district to engage businesses. And so I would love to, would love to collaborate to coordinate a connection with those businesses that are interested in working with students. Um, so just put that out there. Um, I'm working with the, the school district, the CTE program. Uh, we're doing it individually. Um, so anyway, there's a lot going on. Uh, and then the question is, uh, glad that you segmented it by, uh, you know, type uh, the, the numbers of employees and, and the like. Uh, do you have a flavor of the types of services that these businesses are responding and how that might affect their um, satisfaction level? or their responses in general? Um, yeah, so you mean, let's see here, if I go backwards. So are you talking about these particular categories or talking about something more granular than this? A little more, yeah, just a little more granular maybe. Um, like uh, the, the <laughs> yeah, I guess, I, guess that, I guess that's enough, but yeah. Did you see any patterns in terms of the level of satisfaction based on this breakdown of the response rate? So, Steve, you're asking if if were business services more satisfied or were trade services yes. more or less? Or restaurants or things like that. Yeah. OK, well, we can look into that. Yep. All this stuff is in there. I was also curious, uh, kind of along that same line. Um, this is Tracy here, Kurt. Uh, I saw there was mostly small businesses uh, versus larger companies that was the breakout and wondering whether that skewed the results at all. Um, Tracy, it could, but if you think about Pleasanton's business community, we are 99% small business, right? People are companies that have less than hundred employees, right? And so because the survey was intended to be statistically valid, Right, we needed to reflect that in the in who we surveyed and what those responses were. So, fair point. Mostly, largely small businesses, right? And that and that surprised me actually, and I don't know why because I drive by all the small businesses all the time. Um, but it was also thinking about you know the employees or how many people or the or the money down the road for the larger corporation, um, life sciences, et cetera, that we were interested in attracting. Thank you. But just as a data point, when we keep our large employers list, which we have tagged at hundred or more employees, at any given point in time, that list fluctuates between forty to fifty ish companies. 
out of the 4,000 plus in-town commercial companies that we have here in Pleasanton. So that might give you some perspective on, even though those companies are incredibly important and they have a large number of employers, that's not the lion's share of the- That the definitely top. puts it in perspective, thank you. Yeah. And just to follow up Kelly's question about the, the how many employees, the list that we provided to FM3, there were about over 4,400 businesses listed on that commercial business list. So that's that was the, the number of businesses that they then contacted to um, participate. Yeah, and I think it ended up being a little less than that once we right. took out businesses for which there wasn't contact information, but it was in that range, over 4,000. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else at this point? Thank or we you. can let Kurt keep going? Just a quick thought. Uh, was there segmentation on the location? Like I know that uh, you know the places that businesses downtown get a lot of attention. I wonder if there's a feeling of neglect uh, of businesses or elsewhere. Hmm. We we only had it by by zip code. Now the mm -hmm. the database in the cities would have more specific address information, which we we could do additional analysis on. Um, we did not include that. Initially, though, we'd have to rely upon the probably the city to kind of tell us what the what addresses fall into which category around downtown or something like that. But that's not that's that's conceivably done as long as that address information is in the, the database that the city has. Yeah, then you probably have to get into how much they all pay for rent, et cetera, on on and on on that one for location. But that's interesting questions to you. Everybody good for now? Okay, I can see Kurt's feverishly making notes, but Kurt, ready to go on to the next uh, phase when you are. All right, good. That gave me a chance to get a little more coffee in me too. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, all right, um, so pandemic. So in terms of reading the city's communication with business owners, um, three out of five said they thought the city did an excellent or good job, about a quarter said fair and about one in 10 said poor, so this is overall pretty pretty positive here. Only one in 10 had any real significant misgivings and, and a pretty solid majority said the city did a good job. In, in terms of the business, actual services related to supporting businesses during the pandemic, uh, that number is a little lower, but you'll see that that's a lot, some of that is in the don't know category got a little bit bigger at the bottom there. So about half said the city did an excellent good job Again, about a quarter said fair, and you know, a couple more points said poor, but it's a very similar distribution. And I'm sure for a lot of businesses, and you know, particularly the small, you know, they probably didn't reach out to the city uh, or weren't really sure what the city was doing or didn't really need assistance from the city. So you'd have a little more undecided there. And we did look at these by in the, in the, the quick categories. And so obviously, I don't know, geography is different things we could do or business type here. Um, if you look at this, those who've been in the city longer, um, and this is the, the pandemic service provision here, were a little lower on the excellent good numbers. Um, those who had more employees, though, were a little more on the high end of that. You know, so that 55% that say did an excellent good job versus those who are just uh, you know, a small company there, we're at 44%. Um, by zip code, there's a little difference there and I'll let, that's more of a local thing. Um, so the, the, this one, we actually saw some distinctions here. This is services provided by the city to support businesses during the pandemic. Um, we did ask if you've taken any actions over the last couple of years in response to the pandemic, and you could select with a multiple select. You could select many different things here. What were they? And this is broad strokes and not entirely true because there's so many different circumstances, but we kind of did the more positive blue and the more negative orange. It's not entirely true because there could be plenty of reasons why or not you expanded your number of employees during the pandemic that were, but basically, hey, we did more flexible hours. We introduced different types of remote or contactless services. Um, we increased work from home, you know, all those sort of flexibility things. So about half of 
the companies we surveyed did some version of those. Um, and then in terms of more contractions here, reducing hours of employees being paid or operation, reducing number of services, pausing, laying off employees, those were those orange bars. So about a third, so they reduced hours to some extent there, and then maybe another quarter so they reduced services or, or paused for, for a while. And almost one in five, 18%. So they actually had to lay people off during this. Um, increased, you know, and so, so those are the big categories here. I think the big takeaway is half of Pleasant businesses uh, adopted some sort of alternative work hours or ways to interact with their clients that were more remote or contactless. Um, we did ask a question about where folks may have, the businesses may have gotten some sort of aid or participated in some sort of program. So in terms of city programs, I'll make the CARES pretty low. So you know, PPP was obviously at the top of the list, about half, so they participated in the PPP program, which was, uh, I'm sure, I'll, you know, us like everybody else was applying for that at their first time, there's a complicated process. Um, so that was about a half of the uh, business and pleasant in there. Um, and then there was, you know, the, in terms of other types of federal programs, there weren't a ton of things there. We actually had a couple of people said they used GoFundMe, which I am guessing, maybe some of you know them, which are probably like you're more around the corner local businesses, because I've never seen those in my neighborhood as well. You know, help out the local, whatever it was. Um, but about third said they didn't receive any sort of data from any of these types of programs. And then that, that was kind of surprising. I thought that would be a lower number, frankly. And then um, sort of moving past the pandemic, you know, if you sort of, are you doing better or worse or about the same? Uh, about a quarter said about the same. Two in five said they're doing worse than they were before the pandemic. And about a third said better. I think it was on our last call here, there, someone brought up the fact that like, it's been mixed for different companies or experienced during the pandemic. Some because of the type of services they offered or products they sold actually, you know, they expanded a little bit um, while a big chunk obviously did not. And so it was about, if you think about it in groups, you know, four, two in five said worse, three in 10 said better, quarters have stayed the same. Not a perfectly even distribution, but I think it's safe to say that the uh, where people are now in terms of their business operations is a, is a mixture in Pleasanton. And, and here where we saw some interesting differences here. So the companies who have been in the city less than five years were basically a two to one ratio more likely to say their company is doing better now than worse. Um, and those who have been in the city for more than two decades were the inverse of that, where they're two to one ratio roughly of worse to better. So the newer companies fared better than the longer standing companies. Um, if you look at the by employees, the really small ones, the, you know, one or two person shops, uh, a plurality of them said they're doing worse now. The larger companies and larger being you know, more than you know, double digits, basically 11 or more, uh, were about evenly split on that metric. So it seems like bigger companies fared a little better during the pandemic and those who were newer to the city. Now, whether that's new, newness to the city may not be as much of a factor as they're just a newer business where maybe they didn't have as many, you know, they were more uh, potentially adaptable just because their business processes weren't as entrenched. It could be a variety of other factors. And let's look at um, um, the, by business type too. So we, we had that bigger list and I think it was maybe Steve who asked for it. Um, because the numbers get kind of small in some of those categories, we were just looking at the, the ones that the top four types of categories because it gets you know, single digit percentages of the sample were some of those other categories. So who did better or worse here? Um, professional services, 69% um, of those types of businesses said they were doing worse now. So that was a, a clear outlier. Business services, again, a little more negative than positive. 
healthcare and trade services were you know, marginally more positive or sort of split the difference. Um, so I think it's really those business services and professional service companies in Pleasanton that said, wow, we're doing worse than we did were two years ago. Um, so this is a, a version of a question that we that we ask for all sorts of voter and resident surveys as well. But a sort of, of the problems, this is a little different of that your business, you know, is basically had during the course of the pandemic here. How serious of a problem is this? Uh, are they extremely, very serious, somewhat serious, or not too serious of a problem? And so Lisa was like, what are the things that the companies have been wrestling with during the pandemic here? And almost half said they're really concerned about, you know, basically the, the health and safety of, the, of their employees uh, being exposed to the, to the virus. Um, and we, you know, we were looking at just a very extremely serious, you could lump someone in there too, but the, looking, we're trying to sort out which ones have the most intense reactions here. Um, declining business sales, offering competitive wages, Emotional health, they're all kind of in the same-ish category, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Um, so you have the exposure of employees at the top of the list. And towards the bottom here, you've got daycare, childcare challenges. Only 17% thought that was an extremely very serious problem. Um, and then lack of technology um, and ability to, to basically run operations online. A full 61% said so that was not too serious of a problem. For them, so that doesn't seem to be a big challenge, um, but there was a lot of concern about their own, you know, health of their employees. All right. Okay. The next section here is interactions with the city. So permitting process. Um, if you've been involved with the permitting process in the past year, so this is full during pandemic year. Uh, only 14% said yes. Um, you'll see that there's 3% in person, 5% of those online. Le uh, so 11 total online, if you add this up together, um, you can see a little bit of the flavor there of who are most likely to have been involved in the, in the permitting process. Trade services, food services, bigger businesses. And then we asked about, well, okay, how did that process go? And keep in mind, this is only 46 um, businesses um, who had done anything in the last year. And so going back further doesn't make, you know, things change so much. We want to see about the more near-term experiences here. And their reactions about the experiences were very, very positive. 90% said it was, uh, you know, they were, they were satisfied. Um, so you're going down, I mean, responsiveness was a little bit further down the list here. Um, so it, generally speaking here, it's, it's a, uh, sorry, I'll just make a note here. Um, the whole interaction was really positive. I think it's, this one is kind of interesting to look at a track, um, which is, would you say it was easy or difficult process, the permitting process? Um, the, the questions were 57% said it was easy. Um, 42% said so difficult. It's kind of in the ballpark of what it was in 2015. 2015 was a little bit higher on the easy ease level, a little bit lower on difficult level, but still above way back in 2012. And obviously, the, the city changed this process during the pandemic. And this gets to this next slide here, which is, well, this online option has, has become a really big difference. Um, it was virtually all in person, my understanding was, a couple of years ago. Um, and that has online option. And, and it looks like only 16% of these folks who said that they would prefer in person, a third said they prefer online, and another roughly third, a little more than that, said it makes no difference, which suggests that moving a lot of these processes online, at least amongst most of the businesses, is perfectly acceptable and to some even preferable. So this is a little different from just the permitting, but have you basically talked to any city staff um, over the, you know, in the past year? So this could have been about the permitting process, but it could have been around any other types of issues. And so, you know, permitting, we only saw 14% of the respondents said they've been involved with that in the last year, but about a third said they've had some other types of contacts with the city. 
Uh, and it's a mixture of in-person and online. Um, and you'll see that the newer businesses, not shockingly, a little more likely to, but close to two thirds said, eh, nope, I haven't done anything. But about a third said they've had some interaction. We asked the same sort of scale here. Um, and it's if you're looking at this, uh, very, very positive reactions in terms of you know, being responsive, helpful, fair, courteous, um, all really positive interactions with the city staff. And I think this might be the last section here, which is um, internet and phone service. We had a, a conversation about that last time I was able to join this, this, uh, meet, this meeting. Um, would you say that the service is reliable? Um, it's for internet, high speed, reliable phone service. And how important are these to you? Well, all those things are incredibly important to all businesses. Basically, nine out of ten said all these things were very important to them, uh, and are important to their business, specifically speaking. Being having reliable internet, high speed internet, and, and reliable phone service. Um, have they had any problems obtaining these three categories? Um, in the, you know, more than two in five, and pushing half, so they've had some level of problem with with these categories here. The, they're not a big distinction between them, and it's often the same service provider or providers. In fairness, here, um, so in that 15% range, so they've had major problems with one of these categories, and about half of that haven't really had any problems. So this does seem like um, something where there are, you know close to half are saying they've had some sort of bumps in the road in, in either acquiring or maintaining these services for their businesses. Um, and, and a pretty solid majority, it's not overwhelming, but solid majorities feel like the city should have some role in, in helping provide businesses with these types of services here. Um, that's gone up from 2015, where it was only 57%. Now, uh, basically two thirds feel like the city should have some sort of um, uh, role. And that gets us to some conclusions here. We did ask one sort of random open-ended question here. At the end, everything else you've been going through here, what's the, what's really important? What else do we want to tell us to do about business for businesses? Um, and it was a wide range of things. It wasn't one thing that 50% of the respondents cited um, but one in five said something about just more different types of businesses, the range of businesses that are in the community. Um, you know, one in 10, 11% basically said, I can't think of anything. I'm just going to say, you know, city's doing a really good job. Another 6% said they just couldn't think of anything, period. It's a real mixture here. We've got parking, public safety, Wi Fi, roads, cost of living, affordable housing, all kind of in, you know, mentioned all mattering around there. Um, it, so the only thing that kind of stood out was just different types of businesses and a more variety in that regard. And this here is just a couple of uh, a couple of those illustrative comments here, you know, um, but, you know biggest problems affordable housing. Um, I, we get a lot of support from the city. So it's easy to do work here. We got to worry about safety, affordable high speed internet. Um, here's a comment about the lower left-hand corner. Everything doesn't revolve around downtown. That gets us to our just concluding points here. Businesses, I think, and this is not a shock um, given the results. I mean, it's been a long time, but from the last surveys here, they're happy with the. <laughs> They're happy with the place uh, physically and they're happy with the city and the services it provides there. Feels like attracting and retaining employees and specifically if you start connecting the dots here, it's around housing costs. It, it is challenging, but so many of those factors they had very positive impressions with, very positive uh, interactions with city staff. Um, in terms of the permitting process, it feels like there might be a, a leaning to the online is something that obviously businesses wanna see stay a plurality were either indifferent or preferred online, frankly, to in person here. Um, in terms of the, the pandemic itself, there were positive re remarks for the city as well. Um, although, you know, there's a mixture of impressions about how the businesses are doing post-pandemic. 
it, it wasn't all negative. Um, more said they are not doing as well as they were in the past, but a appreciable number said they actually were doing better. So it's kind of a mixed bag, broadly speaking, across the entire business community here. Um, and, and the high speed internet and, and cell phone coverage that continues to be something that is deemed as very important by local businesses and something that the majority would like to see the city help address. And that gets me to the end. All right. Um, I'm always curious, with, particularly something like this that hasn't been done in so long, if there's anything that was surprising in the results, or does this all seem like predictable or something that was, wow, I thought this would be more negative or more positive or what have you. Well, I know that during a pandemic and when people are hurting for cash and employees and all the above, they always like to blame someone else. And um, I'd like to say I was pretty um, pleased with the results the city got for um, services and for being able to be courteous, helpful, et cetera. Um, and in fact, in the couple places that it might have shown something as being off, it's like, and who had full amount of uh, team or staff able to, to do that during the last two years. So I was very pleased with that, those results for the city. Not that I, I doubted it, it's just that people do like to, um, to complain. So that was good to see. Yeah, I think what Tracy said is true. People like to complain. And I thought the results were quite positive and it's really a testament to all of you who work at the city. So congratulations and thank you for great services. I'd, I'd love to get, you know, maybe a takeaway from, from you about what, what your takeaways are and what you see as opportunities, or is it more kind of delivering more of the great work that you're already providing? Steve, where you're directing that at staff, right? That's yes. I assumed you were asking me and Lisa. Lisa, you wanna jump in? Um, I think I have to think about that a little bit. I mean, a lot, I think a lot of the questions were directed primarily and sort of stand out for the permit center. And so I know that during the pandemic, there were, you know, definitely challenges. Um, and, and I think the results of this survey will, will be shared with city staff, um, particularly, you know, the community development department and, and see how we sort of move forward on prioritizing or, or looking at online services um, and things like that. In terms of communication, we had a lot of communication with businesses during the pandemic. A lot of them were looking for information on financial assistance. And so um, I think the city ad addressed a, a lot of that with our business loan program. And then now more recently with our grant programs. And so, um, I think this information is gonna be really helpful as we move forward in, in looking at our work plan um, in economic development. And so I think those are just my initial thoughts. Yeah, Steve, um, I, you know, I sort of have two, two answers to your question. One's super granular, right? And one's really high level. Mm -hmm. right? So I look at the survey and I, you know, I have thoughts like, okay, we're thinking about that communication, right? And how the businesses ranked communication. And I know that we sent out a tremendous amount of information, but I can also recognize we really relied heavily on email. Yes. And maybe um, we don't have emails for every single business, or maybe that's not the correct email for the decision maker, the people we need to be uh, talking to. So, you know, my thought is how do we do a, a broader job right, of communicating with our businesses across a bunch of different medium, right, so that we know that we're hitting them all. So I think really granular like that. And then as Lisa said, sort of high level, um, what I take away from the survey is um, how are, where are those opportunities um, as we think about our ED work plan or as we think about the update to the city's economic development strategic plan? Right? How do we think this informs those two efforts and areas that we need to spend a little more time and, and energy focusing on? So it's really good feedback for all of us um, internally, but then in the work that we do collectively. Thank you. Like yeah. seeing how um, they think the city should be um, uh, participate in the technology and making sure that that's ongoing. It's noticing that number has gone up since 2015. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that was an interesting one. Steve Van Dorn. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, I, I concur with uh, Steve, uh, number three, uh, great comments about the city staff and the hard work that you do. Um, I think what jumped out at me was just the low number of folks that responded regarding working with the permit center. 46, I think is what was said. I, I, I expected there'd be more. Um, as some of you know, that's kind of one of the big biggest concerns that we hear from some of our members is the challenges, but those that did respond, the 46, were very positive. So I think that's really uh, great um, feedback. Um, I think uh, Melinda and her team are doing a much uh, a mm -hmm. great job. So, so that that's what jumped out at me was just the, uh, and I don't know if 46 is, is that how many, were there like double that that visited the permit center in the last couple of years? I, I have no idea. So I'm just, I was just curious why, why you think that number was so low. So anyway, but I thought overall the, the responses were very good. Steve, I, you know, my um, back of the napkin assessment of why that number is low is we saw much more residential activity in the permit center during COVID, right? Everybody's home there. Mm -hmm. Once we got through the initial restrictions, everybody wants to do their, you know, home improvement projects. They're, they're, they're working at home. They're staying at home. They want to create that environment. And then, um, you know, businesses were just, um, many of them were just trying to hang on, right? And they weren't in the permit center trying to, to build out or do TIs. And we certainly over the arc of the the pandemic have seen that increase a lot, right? Toward the end, and middle to end of 2021 and into 22. But I think that's a reflection when we asked the question about last year, that's sort of a reflection of all of that residential activity finally migrating to commercial back again. Mr. Thank Baker. You. Oh, thank you. Um, I thought the results were exceptionally good in a very trying economic period for the city. Um, I, I thought things would be a little worse. Um, there were a couple things that, um, you know, I point out. One, it seemed like there were some differences in satisfaction between some of the newer businesses and the older businesses. And that probably warrants a little bit of understanding because if the older businesses aren't happy, they're likely to leave or more likely to leave. And so that may be an area worth investigating a little bit further. Mm -hmm. um, second, um, you know, internet and cell service still seems to be a challenge for a lot of the businesses. And it's something we've talked about, um, you know, for quite a while. And it doesn't seem like the businesses uh, have a perception that we're making headway there. Um, so I'm not sure given all the issues we have working with those companies, what more we can do, but it certainly seems to be a concern of the businesses. So that should be a concern of ours. And then the third thing I thought was interesting was it seemed like the vast majority of companies had taken advantage of the uh, payroll protection plan, the PPP uh, process, uh, but it didn't seem like very many had taken um, advantage of like the employee retention credit, which Kurt, I'm assuming you showed under federal tax credits or, and that category I think was about 9%. So it seems like there's a lot of federal money that companies have left on the table. And potentially that's because that's a very confusing program uh, where you need kind of a CPA to sort through some of your payroll records and so forth, especially as it relates to how you've taken advantage of PPP, but there is money out there for companies. And so it's uh, unfortunate that people aren't taking advantage of that. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we can tell them often enough, all of us about what all the different options are. And in fact, I just, um, I think, uh, oh, my my staff member just sent me a new link of a new, he says, oh, this looks like some new money that's out there and available for us to access. Um, it's always tough to tell when it's, you know, and the extension of it, but um, yeah. And then of course, uh, how easy it is or, um, or how much uh, there is to be able to help a business out. I, I, you probably got a lot of that sense, Lisa and Pam about, um, 
you know, whether to go out after a particular loan program based upon what their needs were for doing that. Um, you know, it's Steve, it's something, it's interesting because in, my, in hospitality, um, if you were only down single digits instead of double, that was the new like rah, rah. Um, and I look at this as saying, I, I was too greatly happy about there wasn't any massive, you know, um, drop off of services or assistance, et cetera, um, and especially during a pandemic. So I, I, to me, that was a real win for the city, um, seeing that survey, the survey results. Anybody else want to comment on it? Um, we haven't heard from Sylvia. Did you have anything you wanted to mention or Ellen? Um, uh, actually, after all those information, I still have one question. Uh, do we try our best to reach out to the uh, to the businesses that's not using English uh, as a major communication. I know there are two restaurants, for example, I always go to like uh, Korean Village in the crossroad of Santa Rita and Valley. Their owner, I don't believe they use English that much. And also at the same plaza, there's a, a, another restaurant called Hunan Chef. They have a lot of business during pandemic and they serve a lot of uh, people who, you know, cannot cook or do, uh, you know, have to pick up food. They have a lot of, uh, you know, they have served our community community for a long time. Both these restaurants, at least uh, over 10 years. I believe at least I know these restaurant owner does not using English very fluent, fluently. And I know I have I talked to them about, uh, did you know there's a program in city that you can uh, apply for your pandemic Im uh, impact? They said, I'm too busy, I don't know. And then it's hard for me to read English and those, um, you know, to figure out how to do it. So I just wonder, uh, do we want to try to reach out all those business who has contributed and be here with us, serve this community for a long time, but, but English is not their first, first language. I think the worst to do that. We want to include, my personally, I want to include everybody. We look, we live together. For example, uh, this morning I'm happy to be the leader of leading the uh, pledge of uh, uh, allegiance, uh, which you know give me a, a sense of current situation. Mm -hmm. I, to my personal opinion, and I believe everyone is like that. Most of people who live in the United States have certain concern or connection with their own. Uh, I mean, mothers or before the other countries in the world or other areas in the world. Do we want to fight in between any areas with United States at all? No. We want everybody to be peaceful, have live a better life. But we need communication, right? So as a city, we can do is communicate. I know there's uh, some cost you may need to translate into English, uh, into Chinese or into Korean or into some other languages. We just need to spend a little money on that so that we can include a lot of people. So that's my <laughs> two cents. Thank you, Thank Sylvia. You. I think it's always important to be inclusive and to remember that um, our residents and who we are are many different people. Mm -hmm. And thank you for um, taking up the flag this morning. Appreciate that. Uh, Ellen, did you have any comment you wanted to make? No, I was just kind of listening. I, I echo a lot of the comments that have already been made. It was interesting to see the results and see that most of them were positive. So I didn't have anything additional. I, a lot of the comments that I was thinking about were already included. So Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. How about you, Will? Um, well, no, I think the results were mainly positive. I think there were some uh, discrepancies in between time of uh, length of time in the city and et cetera. But I, I was surprised there were the number of areas that the city has no impact on that people commented on. <laughs> yes. uh, you, you, you know, I don't think the city of Pleasanton really has an effect on, uh, you know, cost of housing or affordability or some of the other areas that they mentioned on. So that, that was surprising to me that, you know, someone who's in business would, um, you know, list something that the city obviously has no impact on as something that's important to the city to take care of. So that, that'd be my basic comment. Yes, Pam's working on that whole free market thing. Um, <laughs> um, and Mr. Uh, Bell, you're back. Uh, yeah, I just had one follow up. One of the, and I think I heard a, there was a Steve one, two, or three mentioned. Perhaps <laughs> I'm going to go. I don't know if it's one, two, or three. Asked about the 
um, businesses that were not just interested in working with local students, but the ones that were most likely not interested. Uh, and that looked like business services and um, professional services. Look like the ones that were the the categories where there was the least amount of in, in, interest there, and per, yeah, sure. particular, particularly professional mm -hmm. services. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, one I would like to address the ranking of the Steves at some point. <laughs> um, but what I, what I was getting it's at it's alphabetical, Steve. Oh, was, oh, <laughs> by last name. Uh, really, really, all right, or by first name. Um, uh, one question I was wondering is, is if we could work with you to identify those businesses that are interested and then, you know, maybe we could facilitate some level of uh, facilitate those internships or facilitate that, that interaction. Yeah, I, I might leave that to, well, the cities. I think sure, of course. we couch this as an anonymous, we couch this as an anonymous survey. Um, so I agree, Kurt. That I might be a little tricky. Tell them. Yeah. yeah, we did well, I, tell them. I, I understand that, but it's just... But Steve, if we can, now that we've sort of got some categories, mm -hmm. so if there's an opportunity to to figure out the the subset, right, of businesses that are in that category that potentially, you know, some outreach could be done to, we can help provide that subset of contact information. That would be great. Sort of have yeah. a, a larger pool to, to mm -hmm. work yeah, and that you. brings us to the next part with uh, Lisa and Pam about what protocol is for getting this um, survey and the report. Um, it will become a report that you give to and comes out when, because um, I know as a committee, this isn't you know public yet. Right. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Tracy. So we will be having an executive report that we will be sharing with um, the city council, with the committee, and, and that'll be the distributed out and available for the public as well via the city's website. And so um, that is what our plan is um, once we finalize the results. Thank you. And my apologies, Tiffany, I missed my co-chair. How did I do that? Did you have any um, other comments you wanted to make on the survey? I, I thought that we covered a lot of great topics. Um, one piece that did stand out and surprise me, I, I think someone else had mentioned, but the, the number of businesses that did not receive any support at all during the pandemic, I, I found that interesting. And um, my brain started, you know, going into, again, how do we, how do we access those businesses be, and how much of that was due to just not knowing what was available because there were so many different programs out there. The city implemented so many different support programs. And um, so I, to me, that just begged more questions and made me want to dive into uh, who those businesses are and, and what was the barrier um, for them and, and how can we um, reach them? So I think that that was really one of my big takeaways. That is, that is a very good point. Um, I know for the hospitality industry specifically, um, the only way I could reach them was showing up on their door. Uh, people were literally pulling 12, 14 hour shifts, um, not leaving. Um, I had them come out and say, I get 1200 emails a week. I, you know, that's not how you'll ever hear from me. So it was, it, there are different ways that we have to, and sometimes it's boots on the ground. And, and um, Pam, that's why I liked how you were thinking about, um, it's not all email about how we reach people. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, thank you, uh, Lisa. Thank you, Kurt, for that uh, very thorough presentation and um, of the survey results. I know we were all looking forward to hearing that. Did, you know, did we do all right, um, et cetera. So um, I also like seeing it's always good to see it in context. And if you look at that in context, uh, in context with the 2015, given the fact that we've just had two years of, of COVID and a pandemic, um, I was actually uh, quite pleasantly surprised by all of that. So um, ready to move on, Lisa? Okay, um, so we just, if there's any, uh, to receive any economic development information or updates, do you have anything else you'd like to report on that? Yes, I did want to point out on the cover sheet, we, I mislabeled item number four. It says sales tax update, but in actuality, the attachment that is in that packet 
is our City of Pleasanton popular annual financial report. So I just wanted to point that out so that, um, and, and that's a really, I think that's a very informational report and it was very nicely done by staff. So please take some time to look at that. Um, and then I also wanted to call out item number five. We did an ad in um, the Visit Tri-Valley Inspiration Guide. And so that's the very last page of that um, part of the packet. And then we went ahead and mailed out copies of uh, Tracy's Visit Tri-Valley Inspiration Guide to everybody on the committee. So you'll be getting one of these in the mail because we wanted to really show um, all the great things that are happening here in the Tri-Valley and particularly in Pleasanton. And we just really loved the ad that we did. So thanks so much, Tracy. I just wanted to point that out to everybody. Thank you. And thank you for doing that out on there. Um, uh, and just as a, a little aside, in February alone, um, our website and this visitor's guide is on our website um, so that you can view it digitally. And our website got triple the traffic than it did year over year. So um, that was a really, it was really good to keep getting that. People are feeling better, they're getting out and, um, and we're getting on the map in more and more good ways. So thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Lisa. We will look at that, number four and five, no worries. And then uh, any other matters initiated by this committee? Anybody else wanna bring something up today in our remaining um, 10 minutes? I'd like to bring up the fact that Mr. Van Dorn will uh, be retiring soon. <laughs> and um, you have a month to get in your, your uh, your lunch dates with Steve, but as he told me, um, he isn't dead. He's not going away. Um, he's sticking around. So um, please make sure uh, you contact. But Steve, we just want to thank you for all of the amazing service you have done on behalf of the chamber as director and on this committee. Um, and so thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I, I guess I don't need to come to the next meeting next month. Now. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I know it gets tight, that schedule, when you're on wind down mode. So uh, you better show up then, too. <laughs> so thank, thank you. Trish. Anything else? All right. Well, we're three for three, Ms. Sat, Ms. Adama. So thank you very much for the time uh, today. And um, everybody, we think we will see you in April. So um, just uh, keep a lookout for that invitation. Keep reading the um, documents ahead of time. And keep uh, thinking about the fact that this committee is doing good work and um, working well with the city. Very proud of that. So thanks, everybody. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, folks. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye